Greetings and welcome. This is again Senior English A, and we are involved in a close reading of Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Today we will be working with 1 4, Act 1, Scene 4, in your hymnal on page 350. Let's walk through the play quickly, and I'll help you do it. 1 1 of Macbeth, fair is foul, and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. This will be a play in which Macbeth will be influenced to do things that probably he would not be doing without maybe a little bit of a push. One, two, we're told that Macbeth and his pal Banquo are two seriously uh, stud fighters. And at the end of one, two, Macbeth will be named the Thane of Caldor, which is a great and mighty title. One, three, the most important thing that happens in one, three is Macbeth is hailed by the three witches First as his present title, Thane of Gloms, then as his title soon to be bestowed upon, upon him, Thane of Cawdor, and then finally the third witch will report, prophesy, he shall be king thereafter. Banquio will point out, why do you start and seem to fear things so... Did you catch the word he used? It is the word fair. That is to say... Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Uh, Mr. Nelson, at some point, many of my students of the past have come to this moment as they study Macbeth and, and Hamlet with me, where they will literally say out loud, dude, did Shakespeare mean to do this, or was it just kind of fortuitous luck that he would play these kinds of thematic games through his plays? Well, they have a word for it. It's called genius. And as we get into this play, we're going to identify the ways that there's the overlapping of these kinds of themes. We have a couple of asides by Macbeth in 1-3, just to, to, get, uh, the, to get us caught up. We have a couple of asides in 1-3 where Macbeth is beginning already to think about, and he uses even the M word. Uh-oh, what do I mean by the M word? The word murder. He's already considering murdering the present king, Duncan, because he wants to become king. This is a play again of ambition, of power, of the desire for power, and a man will do anything to get it. 1-4. One 1-4 four. One four is a brief scene, and yet there's going to be one or two moments that are of import. Before I hit the record or the play button here for you to listen to it, I want to set you up to it. The old thing of Cawdor is a traitor. He must be executed. We are in Anglo-Saxon times, and if you break this terrible, egregious violation of, of the rule, you are a traitor to your country and your king. You are executed. However, Duncan will ask about this thing of Cowder. How did, he, how did he die? And he will be told by his son, Malcolm, you know what? He died pretty well, actually. He died pretty well. He died with honor. So even though he was a traitor, he died with honor. Then Duncan says what will become for us memorizable lines. Because we're going to look at these lines over and over again on page 350. Duncan will say at line 12, There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Go back and look at it again, Mr. Durant. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Again, page 350, line 12. Duncan will say about the Thane of Cawdor, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. And then he finishes by saying he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. The old Thane of Cawdor, he says, he completely trusted. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face means what, Mr. Durant? There's no way to do what? There's no way to tell what someone is thinking by looking at their looking at their face. Right, looking at their face. Let's go ahead and put it in your notes now. This is the in, the injection of a major theme of our play. It is the theme of deception, right? Of hypocrisy of always appearing to be something than what you are. Shakespeare loves this theme. We see it in many of his plays. The Duncan King will say, I had no clue. Dude, I totally trusted this guy. Then onto the stage will come everyone. Malcolm is there, his son, as well as Macbeth. 
and Duncan will name his son Malcolm next in line to the throne. Now that's not a huge shock because Malcolm is his son and Duncan is old. But immediately we want to pay attention now to what Macbeth says when he hears that Malcolm is named next in line to the throne. What's wrong with Malcolm being na named next in line to the throne? What's wrong with that for Macbeth? That means he doesn't get to be king, Malcolm gets to be king, which obviously poses a serious problem. Even if he were to kill Duncan, what? He still has the issue of Malcolm, his son. Guess what? Duncan has another son as well. His name is Donald Bain. Okay? So both Donald Bain and Malcolm stand in the way for Macbeth to make it to the throne. Let's take a look at this quick scene. Just listen to it. Take down a few notes as you go. On opposing commission yet to turn. My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death, to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Oh, worthiest cousin! The sin of my ingratitude even now is heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Could thou had less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Oh, welcome, Eva. I have begun to plant thee, and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, that hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so, let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. There if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons! Kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompany him, best him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness, and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger, and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So, humbly, take my leave. My worthy God, All right, here we go. Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down, or else o'er leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, I love fires. But let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. True, worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. Brutal. Totally brutal. Shakespeare will play wicked games with his audience. The king will say, there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. There's no way to tell from somebody's face what he or she is really thinking, really going to do. He's talking, Duncan is talking about the old Thane of Caldor, his past pal who he totally trusted. Then look who walks onto the stage, Macbeth. And he says, Duncan says to Macbeth, 
You're the most amazing warrior guy. Which, of course, we know is true. Remember? He stood out there in the middle of the battlefield, he risked his life, and he killed all these bad guys, correct? He says to Macbeth, you're the most amazing guy. I totally trust you. To which Macbeth says, hey, thanks, pal. Anything for you. I would do anything for you. Duncan then turns around and says, I name my oldest son, Malcolm, next in line to the throne. And then in the aside, Macbeth will say, remember, an aside, he's speaking to the audience to tell the audience what he really feels. I'm on page 352, roughly line 48. Macbeth will say, the Prince of Cumberland, that is, of course, Malcolm, the son of Duncan. The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. What does he say? What does he say? What happened to... Hey, K Sarah Sarah, if chance shall have me king, then chance shall crown me. That's what he said in the last scene. Now all of a sudden he's like, what? Hmm. Malcolm gets named in front of me. Somebody's got to get jacked. Whoa. Look at what he says next. Let not light see my black and deep desires. Why black? Yeah, he's thinking about ways he's going to have to not just kill Duncan, but what? He's going to have to figure out a way to jump to, to Jack as well. The sons of Duncan. Brutal. The eye wink at the hand. Yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. He says, I don't even want to think about how bad I'm going to be. I don't want to think about it because if I do, it could really trouble me. Macbeth has been speaking these lines a little bit to the side of the stage as an aside. Duncan and Banquio have been talking. The audience can tell. They're talking back and forth. Then Duncan, brutal irony. Let's put it in your notes. This is an example of what we call dramatic or on-stage irony, right? Brutal irony. Look what Duncan says, the last lines of the scene. True worthy Banquio, he is full so valiant. He who? He who is so valiant. He's talking about Macbeth. Yes, he's talking about the very guy who has just said in an aside, I'm going to have to kill the old man. And the old man says about Macbeth, Whoa, he is a man above all men, full of valiance, courage, and in his commendation I am fed. Boy, this guy is my true next in line. He is a great fighter, and I can totally trust him. Brutal. The audience is sitting there going, you want to scream it out loud. You stupid old man. You made the mistake the last time with the thing of Cowder by being a little bit too easily fooled, and now you're doing it again. Only the problem is that the audience understands why Duncan would trust this guy. He stood in the middle of the battlefield, we're told, and he fought, risking his own life. There's no reason to believe that Macbeth would be anything other than honorable, dependable, valiant. Notice, let's after him, whose care is gone before to aid us welcome. And then he says it one more time about him. This is just dark irony. It is a peerless kinsman. In other words, there's nothing wrong with Macbeth. You can't find any weakness in the man's character. Oh, brutal. One five. We will now be introduced to one of the more remarkable characters of Shakespeare's entire pantheon. A woman will come on stage. This woman needs to be, as an actress when the play is performed today, she needs to be not only beautiful, but she's got to come across as really a strong woman. She usually comes on wearing black. She usually will have her hair up, pulled away from her face to show the power of her face. And as she comes on, she is reading a letter. The letter is from her guy. Yeah, from her guy. This is Macbeth's girl. She'll be called Lady Macbeth, or Macbeth's wife, throughout the entire play. She's reading a, a letter from Macbeth where Macbeth tells about the three witches and the prophecies of the three witches. And he, she finishes, and she says at line 12, Gloms thou art, and Cawdor, he's just been named Thane of Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Uh-oh. Now there's a reason why yesterday when I said, 
When you ask the question, who's to blame for the psychopathic killer that Macbeth becomes, that Mr. Keeley was quick to jump to the accusation of Lady Macbeth. This is not an unusual observation. We said yesterday, you can blame it on three witches. You can blame it on the prophecy of the three witches. You can blame it on Macbeth himself. You could blame it on Banquo, who knows kind of a little of what's going on. It doesn't say anything. And then, of course, it's too late. Or, as Mr. Keeley reported yesterday, dude, you can just blame it on the very woman that we're watching right now on stage who says, look what she says, and you will be what you are promised. Yet, look what she says. This is fascinating, Mr. Durant. Look at this. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. What has she just said? This is one of those interesting word pictures. You got to understand what she just said. What is it that she's just said about her man? She says, he got promised to be king. He will be king. And yet I fear he is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. What has she just said? He's a wimp. Yeah, he's a wimp. Now, wait a minute. We've just been told about this cat. This is the guy who was standing in the middle of the battlefield fighting 250 bad guys, and he got the one bad guy, and he cut him from his groin to his gullet, told, pulled out all of his entrails, took off his head, and stuck it on a post. That's the guy she's talking about. And she says, I'm afraid he's too much of a wimp. To do what he has to do. Catch the nearest way means what? Right, Jack the King. The only way you can become king is to kill the king, right? So I'm afraid, though, he's a little too much of a nice guy. Then onto the stage comes a servant who says, King Duncan's coming to our house tonight. And she's like, no way. What's in her mind, do you imagine? <laughs> right, we're going to turn our house into the Holiday Inn, or maybe more better for the old Eagle song, the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can't never leave. That is to say, he's coming, but he ain't going. Lady Macbeth is the one who then will step to the front of the stage and will say, we're going to do this thing. We will jack this old man so that my man can become king. And of course, by extension, what? Yeah, if he gets to be king, she gets to be queen, right? Then onto the stage will come Macbeth. And you can tell the, the relationship between the two is pretty close. They'll hug, they'll kiss, etc. They're close. And then they get down to this conversation of Duncan. She asks, when, when does he leave? And Macbeth will say, oh, tomorrow. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see, is what she says. Brutal. In other words, we're going to take care of Duncan at the Holiday Inn tonight. Brutal. To which Macbeth will say, you know, I don't know about this. And then she will say something quite fascinating. She says, my, my, your, my lord, your face is as a book where men may read strange matters. Yeah, you're showing too much. You're giving away too much here. Come on, boy. Wake up. If you're going to be a criminal, you got to be better at this than this. You're giving up too much. Then she uses one of the most brutal word pictures in all of Shakespeare's plays. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. You got into the garden. You see this beautiful flower. You reach down to pick the flower, and from the underside, hidden, is a king cobra. Wham! You're dead. That's the word picture she uses for her guy. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And then immediately, the lines in 1-5 join with the lines in 1-4. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. In other words, you're going to have to be a better actor. Note the irony. The actress playing Lady Macbeth will say to the actor playing Macbeth, you need to be a better actor. Or Duncan's going to figure out that there's something wrong. He will be suspicious. we got to take care of this old man tonight. Brutal. Let's listen to it. Follow along with the lines. Of course, you'll learn to, uh, you'll learn to have a feeling about Lady Macbeth. Mr. Keeley's already expressed this. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh. A 
lend me in the day of success. And I have learned from the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned and desired to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. While I stood wrapped in the wonder, there came missives from the king who all hailed me. Fane of Cordor. By the witch title before, these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail. King that shalt be. That is why I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. I lay it to thy hearth and farewell. Glams thou art, and Cordor. And shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. You're not enough of a man. Not play false. And yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glams, that which cries, Thus thou must do if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishes should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Uh, is not thy master with him? Who words so would have informed for preparation? So please you, it is true, our fame is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is A lost. soliloquy now. She's all alone. Brutal. Brutal. entrance of Duncan under my battle. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the excess and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Whatever in your sightless substances, you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pour thee in the dullest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket. She calls on the powers of evil. Old. Oh, great glams, worthy corner, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Uh, tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. Uh, to beguile the time, look like the time. They are welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. 
He that's coming must be provided for. And you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. <laughs> to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Brutal. Brutal. So basically, basically, let's uh, let's put in our notes what we want to say about Lady Macbeth real quickly, okay? What do we need to say about Lady Macbeth? Well, first of all, let's point out that this is a this is a uh, a, a representative in many ways of Shakespeare's strong woman. All right, we'll see several of these women in Shakespeare's canon. For example, we can, we'll see in King Lear. We'll see uh, Regan and Goneril, some very similar kind of characters. What do we want to say about Lady Macbeth? Well, first of all, first of all, I, we got to be careful here by saying she's crazy, though, because uh, let's point out, she, let's point out, she's fully conscious of what she's doing, right? She understands that she wants the same thing her husband wants. The only difference is, what does she say about her guy? He doesn't have the guts to do it. He doesn't have the guts to do what needs to be done. Therefore, she says, no worries, I take care of everything. This is one of those things where I'll take care of everything. She's strong, strong, she's determined. Let's point out as well, Lady Macbeth is pretty smart. She understands she's going to have to do a sell job on her husband to get him to do what she thinks he really wants to do. Did you notice that? She says, you want to be king. We know that's true already. You just don't got the guts to do what it takes. Then she will come to the front of the stage. Are you ready for this? That line unsex me here. She prays to the devils. She immediately becomes the fourth witch, huh? She prays to the devils, to the powers of evil, to no longer turn her into a woman, but make her a man to give her the strength to do what she has to do. Notice the final line of this scene. Leave everything to me. Duncan will be provided for. Of course, normally if you're at the Holiday Inn, to say we're going to take care of you means we're going to make sure you got a good pillow and an extra, extra blanket. When Lady Macbeth says we're going to take care of you, right? right? Bad news. Now let's finish in your notes by one other observation. Shakespeare is often in his plays teaching his male viewers a simple message. Beware of women. This is a clear message in this play. You gotta watch out for women because they have a way of talking men into doing things men normally wouldn't want to do. Now, as we get into this play a little bit more, we're going to watch this, and we're going to see some interesting things about Lady Macbeth. Final comment about Lady Macbeth. She and Macbeth start out in opposite places when we meet them for the first time. Macbeth is this unbelievably honorable warrior type. Lady Macbeth is this pretty disgusting low-life scumbag. By the end of the play, they will have switched positions. Macbeth, by the end of the play, is going to become a psychopathic killer. And Lady Macbeth will become a woman who has clearly seen, uh-oh, it's the uh-oh moment. Uh-oh, things, oh, this was done badly. I shouldn't have, right? And she will switch. By the end of the play, the audience will have some pity for Lady Macbeth. They will have no pity for the psychopathic killer who becomes Macbeth. Of course, Mr. Keeley's point is well made, I think, from yesterday. Macbeth's fall has, shall we say it, something to do clearly with Lady Macbeth. Come back tomorrow and we'll talk about the ways that women talk men into doing things that they sometimes don't want to do. Judy.